Hi everyone, um, welcome to Complex Analysis and welcome to your first video lecture. I'm going to keep it pretty short today because it's day one um, and we'll, we'll go into more details during the, the in-class session, uh, which is the Zoom meeting at 3 p.m. today. So uh, for the lecture, for the video lecture right now, I just want to introduce you to the complex numbers. Which I'm sure many of you have seen before. Uh, so some of this will be review, uh, but you know, probably by Wednesday for most of you we'll be doing new stuff already. And for some of you today will be new as well, but I just want to start off by getting us on the same page. So we'll just do an introduction. Um, so where do they come from, first of all? So one of the most fundamental questions in mathematics, fundamental, you know, one of the, one of the early questions that people have been asking for quite a while now is, uh, how to find solutions to polynomial equations. Why? Well, because, you know, these are some of the simplest equations that, that, that you can write down and they appear all the time in real life. And so finding their solutions turns out to be really important. Um, you know, so for instance, uh, Hopefully I don't have to convince any of you of the importance of linear algebra. The linear algebra is all about finding solutions to linear equations, right? So this, this is polynomials of degree one here. Um, looks like X equals one in this case, uh, you know, but you can easily find real world situations where you need, um, higher degree polynomials. So for instance, let's say you're trying to draw a square and you want the area to be equal to nine, let's say, then the question is, what should the side be, right? And you know that the formula for the area is the square of the side lengths. Um, if you have a square, it's the square of the side length. And so I'm trying to solve the equation x squared equals nine, right? So anyway, polynomials are some of the simplest equations we can write down, so we want to find solutions to them. And if you just start playing around with polynomial equations, you quickly write down things that not only can you not find a solution, but you can actually prove there is no solution, right? So for instance, x squared equals minus 9. Um, this has no solution. Since if I take any number, any real number, and I square it, I get something positive. Or at least non-negative. So I'm never going to get zero, or I'm never going to get a negative number, right? And the idea behind complex analysis, behind complex numbers, is... Um, what if we could take the square root of negative numbers? Let's just pretend we can. Well, if we could do that, we would, we would have more numbers, right? Because, um, we could take the square root of minus one, for instance. And so if we could do that, there would be a number, which was a square root of minus one. So let's give it a name. So let's let I be equal to the square root of minus one. I put it in quotes because it's not a real number, but we're just pretending it is, right? And so in other words, what I'm saying is this, this made up number, 
which I'm calling i, i is for imaginary, so this imaginary number, um, is a solution to a certain polynomial equation, which is the equation x squared equals minus 1, right? So if this number existed, um, then, then I'd already have uh, at least one polynomial equation that didn't have a solution before, but now it does. And by the way, you can notice then that if i is a solution to this equation, then minus i is also a solution. So in fact, just by introducing this one number, I've found two new solutions to this particular polynomial equation. And it turns out lots of other equations also now have solutions if I allow myself this imaginary number. So I can also now solve other equations in terms of this imaginary number. So, you know, for instance, um, the equation x squared equals minus 9 from before. Uh, if, I, if I try to solve this, this is going to say that x has to be equal to plus or minus the square root of minus 9. Um, but I can factor negative 9, right? So that's the square root of minus 1 times 9. And the square root of a product is the product of square roots. So this is square root of minus 1 times square root of 9. And so I get two solutions to this equation as well, um, i times 9 and, and negative i times 9. So the solutions are, uh, I'll write it as 9i and negative 9i. Okay, and so just by introducing this one new solution, uh, square root of minus 1, I'm already solving many different polynomial equations. It turns out I can solve every polynomial equation with just this, you know, just the real numbers and this extra number i. Um, so for instance, you know, the most famous polynomial equation, um, it's degree two, so a quadratic equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. If I try to solve this, in other, if, in other words, if I try to find roots of the left-hand side, uh, the quadratic formula says that this has solutions. x equals to negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac, all of that over 2a. And you've been taught that um, when the discriminant, this quantity in here, is negative, then this has no solutions. But now that we can take square roots of negative numbers, we're going to get solutions to this equation. And in general, um, actually, the fundamental theorem of algebra which, I mean, it's fundamental because it's important. It's maybe not the most exciting theorem, uh, but it's useful. It says that if we allow imaginary numbers, then every polynomial equation has at least one solution. Right, so, so even in the quadratic situation, we may only have one solution um, if this quantity is zero, right? But we always have at least one solution. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's sort of motivating complex numbers, um, or at least imaginary numbers, and now what we want to do is study them. And that's, that's the whole goal of this class is basically to do calculus with uh, these new numbers. So the first thing to observe is uh, we can make new numbers out 
out of real numbers and imaginary numbers. So for instance, um, I already made the number three times i. Um, in general, you know, I can just take a real number and I can add it to a real multiple of a complex number, or sorry, a real multiple of, of i, and, and this gives me something new. Um, and these are called complex numbers. So if x and y are real numbers, then I can make a new number, x plus y times the square root of minus 1. And this is going to be called a complex number. So the definition of a complex number is it's, um, it's something of this form. It's, it's something real plus a multiple of square root of minus 1. Okay. So x, x here is the real part. And we call y the imaginary part. So an imaginary number is, is a multiple of square root of minus 1. And so this, this is the sum of a real number and an imaginary number. Okay. And so, I mean, the thing to notice here is, is that, so these are all the complex numbers. This is what I mean when I say a complex number, and it's determined by two pieces of data. It's determined by its real part, and it's determined by its imaginary part. So complex number Z is determined by its real part and imaginary part. So sometimes we will um, write, write some complex number, which is equal to x plus i, y, as just um, a pair of the two pieces of data we need, the real part and the imaginary part. So it's determined by x and y. So we could just write it as this pair of real numbers. Okay. And what this means is that we can visualize complex numbers um, as pairs of real numbers. And we know how to graph pairs of real numbers. Um, they live on the plane, right? And, and you know, the notation is suggestive here. It's got an x coordinate and a y coordinate, right? So I can visualize a complex number as a point on the plane. Right, so remember, if I want to visualize real numbers, which are sometimes denoted by a, a bold R, I use the number line. So I've got 0, and then positive numbers to the right. Maybe this is 5. Negative numbers to the left, of course. And then I can visualize complex numbers in a similar way, but but there's there's two real numbers that go into the data, x and y. And so instead of being on a line, they're on the plane. And the complex numbers are sometimes denoted with a bold C. So here's the plane. And here's the the number zero, thought of as a complex number. I guess it's it's zero plus zero times i. Right? So in coordinates, it's just 0, comma 0. And let's graph a few more. So just the number 1 is right here because its y coordinate is 0, right? 1 is the same as 1 plus 0 times i. Um, negative 1 is right here. And so you can see you've got the real numbers living inside here as, as the x-axis. So this is, this is what's called the real axis. And, right, because 1 is equal to 1 plus 0i, which is, can be represented in coordinates as just 1 comma 0. Um, what about the imaginary number i, for instance? Well, this is, this is 0 plus 1 times i. So in coordinates, this is 0 comma 1. The imaginary part is 1 times i. 
So that's right here. I is here. And negative I has a negative one as the second coordinate. So it's right here. Okay. And in general, um, some complex number x plus i y well where does it live well it's it's real part is x and so i go over x distance on the number line this is x and its imaginary part is y so i go up a distance of y and that's how i graph that point okay so we can visualize the complex numbers as points on a plane okay so we've got these new numbers. Um, what else can we do with them? Well, we can actually do all the things that one can do with real numbers. So for instance, we can add and multiply. Then, uh, why? Well, we know how to add real numbers and multiply real numbers. And we know how to multiply i as well because we know what i squared is. And that's kind of enough to tell us everything. So for instance, let's say I've got um, z1 is equal to x plus i y, z2 is equal to a plus i b, so a and b are also real numbers here. Then z1 plus z2, I can, I can figure out what this is. It's x plus i y plus a plus i b, And I'm gonna I'm gonna group these these numbers um, according to whether they're real or imaginary, and so I can um, reorder this. So this is x plus a plus i y plus i b. And I can think of this as the real part plus distributive property. I can pull out the i y plus b. Okay, and so this new number. Is, has real part x plus a is just the sum of the two real parts and its imaginary part is the sum of the imaginary parts. Um, multiplication is a little more interesting. If I want to take z1 times z2, it's you, you end up with a formula that you probably wouldn't be able to just guess. You know, addition, you could sort of guess that this is what happens, but the multiplication is more complicated. In particular, it's not going to be x times a plus i y times b. That's not going to be the right thing to do. Because we want multiplication to work the way it does with real numbers. In other words, um, if I want to figure out what this product is, I should do what I would normally do if I have a product of uh, two things in parentheses where the parentheses are sums, which is uh, distribute, right? Do FOIL. And so this is x times a plus, um, well, I don't know the best order to do this, but x times a plus x times ib plus iy times a plus iy times ib. Okay, and um, yeah, I can I can reorder some things here. So uh, let's see here. This is x a plus. I'm gonna pull the i's out to the left. So i x b plus i y a. Here I have two i's, so I get an i squared times y times b. But we know what i squared is, right? It's minus one. That's how we defined i. And so, so this part is equal to just negative yb. So now I can group things according to whether they're real or imaginary. So this is xa minus yb plus i times xb plus ya. So just, you know, just doing multiplication as you would hope it would work. This is what you get, and this turns out to work really well. Um, so a couple questions at this point, which I'm not going to answer, but I'd encourage you to think about, um, can we divide complex numbers? Can we take two complex numbers and divide one by the other? So this is a little 
tricky. And if you haven't seen the solution before, so the, the answer is yes. But if, if you haven't seen how to do this before, um, it's kind of hard to figure out on your own. Uh, but if you, if you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to play around with it, see what you come up with. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, we, we know how to graph complex numbers as points in the plane. So the question is, what does adding and multiplying look like visually? You know, if I graph these two points in the plane and I add them or I multiply them, what's, what's going on in the plane? What, where's the new point land, basically, in terms of the geometry? And one of these uh, you can figure out maybe without too much difficulty and the other is a little harder. So uh, think about those and um, maybe start on the homework if you have time. And I will see you at 3 p.m. later on today if you're, if you're watching this on the first day of class. All right.